Happy Wednesday, everyone. I am um, coming to you live today from my home in Washington, D.C. And I'll wait a little while to hopefully see a few folk join me for some reflection and conversation today. Hey, John, good to see you. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, Max, great to see you. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chuck. Glad to see folks joining me here today. I'm, my name is Ginger Gaines Sorelli. I am the senior pastor at Foundry United Methodist Church here in Washington, D.C. And every Wednesday for a number of weeks at noon Eastern time, I come into this space, the purple parlor in my house, and share some thoughts and hopefully some words that are encouraging or helpful in some way. <laughs> and I want to say up front as we're gathering in community today, there may be some noise, some background noise today, uh, more than usual even. I am in the process here at our house. We have uh, some work on our roof happening. So there may be pounding, sawing, <laughs> various activity um, on the structure in which I'm sitting right now. So I apologize, I hope it's not too distracting today. But I'm glad to be with all of you. And here is what has been on my mind. Of course, lots has been going on, as I trust you all are also holding. Um, but as we have come through the last week or two weeks of really powerful and well, powerful responses and witness and protest, seeing people from across uh, so many different places and in so many different places coming together to, to say that Black Lives Matter and that our society and culture needs to change. It's been really, really something to be a part of and to witness. And one of the things where my, my mind has started to go, and, and even over the last week, one of the primary things in my head and heart has been a concern for the ways that in the years I've lived in D.C. and served the church in D.C., I've seen a number of powerful protests and marches that fill the city. And then the crowds begin to ebb and it's very rare that we see any real policy change, any real change in the issue or the concern that had initially brought so many people together and that's been, that's been very much front and center in my thinking over these last days that the, there are those who say that something feels different in this moment, that it seems there might be a possibility for things to change. I've seen some lists of things that are already being changed, literal policies or practices at the the government level, local governments and, and other places and organizations. And I'm grateful uh, for the ways that that is or may be happening. But my larger concern is that this moment is one that I feel God is, is stirring and really the opportunity is so great to do something new <laughs> and to bring deeper uh, justice and heal, to bring justice and healing, not deeper, because we have been in, an, in the absence of that for our black 
siblings are black and brown siblings and neighbors. And we have an opportunity right now. I'm, I'm concerned that we may miss it um, and just move on. Um, and I don't think that anybody wants that. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that it, it's very common and it's easy to do for a number of reasons. P part of it is, of course, big challenges are hard to know where to begin. And so one of the, the places that we begin oftentimes is to speak up and to speak out, and that's important. Especially in these times, it's so important for those of us um, who maybe have not always felt the need to say anything, to do anything, to show up, to put ourselves out there. It's so important for us right now to not be silent. You may have seen the signs that say, white silence is violence. Um, and the famous quote by Reverend uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, talking about um, the silence of our friends is worse sometimes than the, the hate, hateful actions of our enemies. Um, the silence of our friends. We, we can't be silent right now uh, if we are truly trying to stand on the cause of right. And yet, there has to be more than just our words. And I was thinking about that and the ways that sometimes uh, it's hard to know what else to do. Um, so we do that. But then it's sometimes really difficult to figure out what the next steps are. So I wanna, I wanna think with us a little bit about those things today. I have been finding, <laughs> I've been finding myself uh, fairly regularly over the last couple of weeks thinking about certain issues and going, oh, I think I wrote something about that once. And I've been grateful that some, in, because it's just been, there's been so much to hold and process and ponder in these last weeks. And so it's been nice to not have to start from scratch. And I've been able to go back to uh, a book that I wrote um, to be, to sort of ground my own self and I found a piece today, I'm gonna to put my glasses on because my eyes, my eyes are tired. Um, so I'm just gonna give myself that benefit. Um, but I'm gonna read a little bit from um, Sacred Resistance um, about this whole bit of how we engage in these moments. And this was in a section where I was talking about trying to keep crisis in perspective. Um, and I, tw I quote uh, my, my colleague uh, and our pastor, Ben Roberts, one of our pastors at Foundry. Um, you know, just before I share this, I need to say how grateful I am for the, the colleagues that I have served with at Foundry and in other places, but my goodness, the last number of years, um, I learned so much. My, uh, my colleagues teach me daily through what they do, through what they say, through their, their questions uh, and their push, their push back on things. And, you know, um, a former colleague, a friend, um, Teresa Thames, often in her comments on social media, talks about iron, sharpening iron. And I feel so blessed to be sharpened by so many smart, capable, strong colleagues. Anyway, this, is, this references uh, my colleague Ben in what he uh, used to call, I don't know if he still uses this term, but this was a couple of years ago, he would call it policy by Twitter. <laughs> and uh, I'll just read to you what I wrote here. Deacon Ben Roberts, who is our Director of Social Justice Ministries, defines policy by Twitter as, quote, unsustainable, reactionary, and opportunistic responses to real social challenges that only last for a short period of time and rarely result in a solution to the original problem. And then I go on to reflect on this. In our zeal to want to respond, we can lose perspective, if we're not careful, and begin to think that a tweet storm using the hashtag du jour 
will make a substantive contribution toward alleviating injustice or creating positive change. There are a handful of public figures for whom that strategy might work, but for the rest of us, such a tactic may lead to a sense that we have done something meaningful for the common good when all we have done is convince ourselves that we're woke as we move on to the next item on our to-do list and wait for the next opportunity to join the social media fray. This is not to suggest that our words and public stance are unimportant. I wanna be really clear about that. Our words and our public stance are so important and I'm not saying that they're not, but rather I'm saying we need to keep proper perspective about what is happening and about what role we are called to play and if and how our public engagement will affect, really affect any positive outcome. There was a, uh, as I was writing this book, some of you will remember the deadly Unite the Right rally. Some of you may remember this, any of y'all remember this? The deadly Unite the Right rally organized by white nationalist Richard Spencer in Charlottesville, Virginia. And so I had that front of mind as I was writing this and I had come across this response from, on a Facebook post of all things from Chris Newman, who lives in Charlottesville and describes himself in that community as quote, your local black farmer. And his, his Facebook post went viral, it was everywhere. Now, Newman did not praise those involved in the counter protests in response to the white nationalists carrying torches. Rather, he called out the pervasive segregation and racial profiling that he experiences in the community where he lives on a regular basis and the ways that those realities affect his business and his daily life. He did not mince words when he named the hypocrisy of the city's progressives who assume that the race problem has nothing to do with them, but only to do with Confederate flag wavers. His request was simple, put down the vigil candles and take up the work of dismantling racism in Charlottesville. And I use this as an example for us to think about what is it we're really doing. Keeping crisis in perspective as we seek to serve the common good means not only jumping into the flow of a protest march, though that is certainly a valid and powerful act of sacred resistance. Again, what we say, where we stand, and with whom matter. So I'm not saying that that doesn't matter but we also need to recognize the larger issues at play, the deeper realities that exist, and our own culpability in the ongoing systems of injustice to which whatever march or protest is responding. And as followers of Jesus, part of proper perspective will always be to search our own hearts for the ways that we need to change. It's so easy for us it's easy to look at certain people and say, oh, they're the problem. They're the, the bad guys. And so much of our call in any moment is to search our own hearts and to, to listen for God's um, voice to help us know what we need to do differently. The question is where and how God calls you to respond, to change, to engage, to study, serve, pray, and advocate so that your engagement in the struggle does more than salve your personal conscience or nurture an emotionally satisfying moral outrage. The perspective of God's saving, mending love is the broader context. God's hope for a world that is more gentle and just is the context and both our voice our witness, our what I call our body language, our stance, where we stand and with whom, all of that matters. Ultimately, pa I can always hear Pastor Ben in my head saying, what difference will it make to the lives of those whose lives are endangered, are um, not receiving 
their daily bread are not being treated with the full dignity of beloved children of God. What difference does your action make? That's the question. And sometimes it's hard to know what to do. I, in a sermon, I don't know, in the last couple of weeks, I suggested, I think maybe Pentecost, I said, you know, the place to begin, the way to begin, is to begin. And some of us, for some of us, that is speaking up. That's taking the risk, which is very risky for many people in many places, to say something, to put yourself out there socially. Um, that's important. Um, begin by beginning, whatever that thing needs to be, and begin where you are. You don't have to take on the whole thing. What is, what is the piece that is before you? What is it that you can do where you are right now to begin being and becoming an anti-racist, being a true ally in the struggle and um, making some substantive change. And so a few things I'll just suggest. There are lots of ways to do that. Um, first, you know, it, so much of it is about doing your own work, knowing where you stand in the struggle. And um, read, study, share with other people. And uh, this has been also repeated a lot, um, but in case you haven't heard this clearly, if you are, um, Hello, are we still there? Can I get a hands up? All of a sudden it was getting funny. Someone tell me that you're with me. Okay, are we back? Can you hear me right now? Great, okay. So I will try to wrap up because it looks like we're getting a little twitchy. But I want, to, I want to just encourage you to do your own work and uh, try, and please don't turn to your colleagues and friends of color to, um, to be the primary folk with whom you're working um, on your stuff. There are lots of us out there who can have this conversation together. Um, but try to find some things to read. Foundry's website has a, a really broad um, reading list of books. There are so many powerful articles and resources now. So do your own study and your own work. I also encourage you to give. This is something you can do. Find organizations that are doing anti-racist work. Um, give to churches like Foundry who are committed to the work of anti-racism. Give, you know, put your, put your money where your mouth is, uh, is one way to really make a difference. Vote and help register voters and pay attention to these headlines uh, and stories about voter suppression because voter suppression is real, y'all. It is a real thing. Um, and it's um, driven by racism, I'm convinced. Um, so uh, let's, let's do what we can to, to do something about that, uh, if and when we can. Talk to your people and your elected officials. Um, and be connected locally. If you're part of D.C., one of the ways you can do that right now is by engaging with the Way Home campaign's uh, house meetings that are talking about not only, they'll be talking about, of course, uh, chronic homelessness and how to end chronic homelessness, but also all of those intersections of justice that uh, lead people to that state, and race will be a, a big piece of that as well. So I want to encourage you, um, check out the, the information on, at Foundry um, through Pastor Ben and others um, to connect with the house meetings happening just this week. This is something you can do. It affects our, we're talking about the DC budget. Um, and that process is happening now. So any conversation you can be a part of uh, to add your voice to conversations about the money in our city is gonna be really, really critical. And that, whether you're, you're local or anywhere, engage the budget process in your town, city, county, whatever, um, because that's, that's, you know, that's where some real change begins to happen. So, um, so today, I wanna to say thank you for standing up and speaking out, for using your voices, for looking at where you stand and with whom, um, and wanna just remind us all of the ongoing work. One of the other things that people have been saying a lot is this is a marathon, not a sprint. So, um, and that's true. Um, but this is a, I, it could be a real turning point uh, if we do 
the work that is ours to do. And so that is my prayer, that we will not miss this opportunity and that Foundry and other people of faith and conscience in whatever your context, wherever you are, that you will begin. If you're just beginning, that you'll begin. Uh, if you've been at this work, that you will continue and um, that we will, will do whatever we can to make something real happen for the better so that our black and brown siblings are safer honored, celebrated, and don't have to live in fear, and that we as a church and as a city will know that we've done all we can to, to work toward and build beloved community. That's our calling. Um, so <sighs> make sure you're taking care of yourselves on the, on the long haul on this marathon, and um, look out for others who are on the way be very gentle with yourself and with other people and um, and do what you can. Let's pray. <laughs> God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the high and holy calling that you give us to be your people and to do justice and to love kindness and walk humbly with you. Give us grace to do it. Um, show us the work that is ours to do and help us have the strength to do it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for hanging in there. I'm sorry if we had a little uh, connection issue in the middle, but hopefully something came through that was useful. Um, it's always a blessing to be with you. May peace abide with you. May the power of God's love and presence sustain you today and in the days to come.